Hello and welcome back to the Fireside Chat at Raisana Dialogue. I'm Maha Siddiqui and with me is the Portuguese Minister, João Gomes Cravino. Many thanks for speaking with us. Thank you very uh, so much. So let's uh, immediately start with the questions that we have for you and a list of questions there, but first related to Ukraine. Uh, now Ukraine has uh, asked for Portugal's help uh, for an EU membership bid. Uh, what kind of help can you render Ukraine at this juncture? Well, of course, uh, Ukraine is really in need of help from all of its friends. It has been uh, attacked without any uh, provocation uh, by Russia and uh, in a manner that uh, threatens the European security order and has wider geopolitical implications also for everywhere, including the Indo-Pacific region. Mm -hmm. With respect to Ukraine's um, eventual future membership mm -hmm. of uh, the European Union, unfortunately, you know, this is a process that takes a long time. Uh, Portugal itself uh, entered the European Union some uh, nine years after applying for its membership. I think that we really need to be focusing on the urgency of the moment. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that membership in the future of the European Union is something that does not solve the, the, the immediate challenges. Mm -hmm. The other is that inevitably the membership process, mm -hmm. the candidacy process, is one that is complex, it's controversial. There are always issues that uh, some member states are in favor of, others are not. I think that one of the most positive aspects that has come out of these uh, current uh, response by the European Union is its unity, its capacity to act as one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the issue of membership of the Ukraine is one that is probably best left for a, a second a second moment. Uh, but the EU Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who had met uh, President Zelensky, indicated that uh, it is only a matter of time, that perhaps the process can be hastened. Is that likely? Certainly it is a matter of time. But the time can be a quite, a, quite a lengthy one. And I think that uh, as uh, we support Ukraine in its uh, bid to defend itself, defend its territorial integrity and its population, the question of um, the intricate negotiations of uh, European Union membership bid naturally have to take a uh, second uh, stage. Hmm, okay. Also, you know, uh, when uh, the president of Ukraine addressed uh, uh, the parliament through via video conferencing, there was a standing ovation. Uh, however, the need of the R, as you said, is pressing for Ukraine for some very critical uh, uh, concrete issues at the moment, and uh, one such need is heavy weapons. Uh, is there some way in which uh, that can be supplied to them? Is, is there some concerted effort to do so? Because uh, yesterday the Lithuanian side expressed uh, its uh, apprehension that it will be able to continue supporting Ukraine if help doesn't come from bigger countries like US, UK, Germany, France, uh, because they need to fortify their own defenses as well. Yes, absolutely. This is happening. Mm. Um, I think uh, all of us uh, European Union member states, uh, NATO countries, uh, have been looking at our, uh, our stocks, our reserve, our capacity to supply Ukraine from the basis of uh, what, we, what we have and we're not using currently. And Portugal, uh, amongst many others, has been supplying with all sorts of equipment, lethal, non-lethal equipment that uh, strengthens Ukraine's uh, self-defense uh, capacity. Uh, now, the need of the hour is, in fact, for heavy weaponry. Portugal has taken uh, the decision to advance with uh, some, with, with, um, uh, some uh, uh, armored personnel carriers and equipment that is uh, useful. Other countries are doing their bit. Germany yesterday announced that it will supply um, tanks equipped with uh, anti-aircraft capacity. And so uh, I believe that, uh, in fact, although not all countries are able to contribute, Lithuania has run down its stocks to a level that beyond which it cannot go. Uh, other countries are facing similar challenges. Uh, I think that, uh, nevertheless, the Ukraine will, will find the support that it needs from uh, friends uh, such as Germany, France, and also Portugal will be there. 
let's talk now about the fallout of uh, the war in Ukraine. And I want to talk first about the broader fallout uh, that uh, many are now questioning about the uh, global order that was in place uh, and also the global platforms that are in place since uh, World War II, for instance, the United Nations as well. Have they not been able to rise up to the occasion? Uh, is that global order as we knew it now in crisis? The global order has been very severely shaken, there's no doubt whatsoever. When you mention the United Nations, quite rightly, what we have here is a situation whereby uh, one of the founding members, a permanent member of the Security Council, brazenly challenges some of the most fundamental tenets of the international order, not invading sovereign countries, not trying to seek uh, borders changes through armed aggression. These are fundamental tenets that uh, Russia has uh, uh, ridden over without uh, regard. And uh, this would be grave from any country, but from a country that is a permanent member of the Security Council, the question that arises is, is this leading the Security Council and the, the United Nations itself to become dysfunctional? We uh, are very, very strongly committed multilateralists. I've had a very interesting uh, conversation with uh, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar in which I sensed that India is also very much uh, concerned and uh, interested in doing what it can to strengthen the United Nations uh, capacity. Uh, but to all of us around the world at this moment are uh, having to think about the manner in which the international order and its uh, cornerstones, its essential elements, have been called into question, and what we can do to rebuild a stable, predictable, rules-based international order. In that context, do you see the rise of newer players then? Yes, absolutely. And uh, interestingly, uh, India is very much uh, in the forefront of that. Of course, over the last uh, couple of decades, uh, the most uh, prominent feature of the changing international geopolitical landscape has been the rise of China. Um, now uh, we are seeing from India not only a very important uh, rise as well, population growth, economic growth, in fact the highest economic growth in the world, but we are seeing as well a new availability to contribute to the international order, to shaping the international order, rather than simply being shapen uh, by what is happening internationally. And we welcome that very much. We are very keen uh, in Portugal, in uh, the European Union, to um, create circumstances or contribute to circumstances whereby the future decades are not simply uh, to or to a two-character story between the US and China, but uh, also involve European countries, India, and in that sense, one of the aspects that has emerged most, cl most clearly in the Rezina dialogues this year has been precisely the opportunities that this new changing geopolitical landscape create for closer uh, India and European Union interaction. So, uh, Minister, at the start of the war, uh, why did we get a sense here in India that the European countries were upset with the stand that India was taking at the United Nations, which uh, India said was a neutral stand, uh, also by asking for cessation of violence, uh, it said it was uh, doing uh, what it should? I, th I think that uh, we all have to respect each other's points of view. and. I have lived in India before, I uh, very much uh, appreciate this country and I've read m a lot about uh, Indian history, politics. I know very well the relationship that developed over decades, many decades, since India's independence between India and the Soviet Union, first India and Russia. This cannot be swept under the carpet in one day. We understand this and we appreciate that India is a country that has a capacity to engage with Russia. Um, having said that, of course, our uh, own position is that Russia should be condemned internationally and we have done our part. We know that uh, ultimately uh, India and uh, Portugal and India and the European countries share fundamental values and concerns about the international order but have different ways of uh, seeking to contribute to international order. And uh, we appreciate that and we are very happy to engage strongly with India uh, on the Ukraine issue, but on so many other issues beyond that as well. In the backdrop of the Ukraine crisis, how do you see uh, the India-European Union uh, engagement now, going further down? 
Well, I think that uh, one of the things that has happened is that the European Union has uh, had a very significant strategic shock. Uh, actually, this was already happening with, uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, as a result, is beginning to think strategically, act strategically. And that makes it a more interesting partner for uh, India as uh, we all seek to deal with a world in which China is rising, in which Russia is acting like a rogue state, and, uh, and therefore the basic uh, tenets, parameters of our uh, international system are being changed. I think that with the challenges uh, of our societies over the next few years, challenges relating to digitalization, for example, to new connectivity challenges, to uh, issues of dealing with climate change. We're going to find a range of issues where both India and the European Union find it imperative to be working closely together. So the circumstances internationally are not good ones, they're not favorable ones, but sometimes out of unfavorable circumstances you do get positive outcomes as well. And I think one positive aspect is certainly the India-EU relationship. And do you see the, the trade aspect uh, between the two sides going uh, further ahead in terms of a possi possible deal? Well, I, I can classify myself as a veteran observer of the EU-India free trade negotiations, uh, having been involved for, for several years, uh, knowing the history. And, um, and now what I am sensing is uh, a renewed dynamic. Yes, it's not the first time where we've had our leaders say, you know, we have to do this. But I believe that now, th now they are doing it with great conviction for two reasons. The economic reasons, I think, are becoming more strongly apparent to both sides. More importantly still, there is a strategic underpinning to the thinking on each side that uh, I believe is going to function as a, as a strong um, motivator. And so uh, I believe that uh, on both sides now there has to be a significant effort in the understanding that we should not just be involved in bean counting in the nitty gritty details which are inevitably a part of international trade negotiations, but, uh, but that we should be capable of fitting this into the wider picture whereby both sides have a lot to gain from concluding a deal. Do you think the Porto summit helped uh, give some sort of direction to India-EU engagement considering that uh, in the backdrop we had seen uh, some hurdles uh, you know, if I can point out one issue uh, would have been Kashmir, human rights. Uh, those issues, have they been ironed out? Well, I inevitably, between uh, European Union countries as a whole and, and India, there will be issues in which we don't see eye to eye on some aspects. But uh, the most important is to understand that, uh, firstly, the issues on which we don't see eye to eye are ones in which we can discuss, we can have a dialogue on, and we can progress in our mutual understanding. And secondly, what unites us is so much more significant. The Porto Summit was a very important one because it was a summit between the European Union and all of its 27 member states and uh, Prime Minister Modi. And this was the first time we've had such a format. It's a format that clearly recognizes the international relevance, uh, the very significant international rele relevance of, of India. It's a format that doesn't exist except with the United States and with China. And so for India to have uh, reached that uh, level of, um, of, of, uh, of, of relevance in the European mind, this is something that our presidency, the Portuguese presidency of the European Union, sought to promote and to bring to the understanding of other member states. And we're very glad that uh, we were successful in this. So it's been a landmark in the EU-India relationship and uh, one which we are looking to build upon now. That'll be all, Minister Gravino. Many thanks for your time. Thank you very much.